value. There's a gentleman about three or four rows back. Uh, this is for Professor Fails. I too was quite struck by your final comment and found it very generous and, and appreciative. And I think as, as most persons of faith, there are occasions when there are construals of God, even in my own tradition, where I would side with you uh, and want to affirm some form of atheism. Um, but it does seem to be the case, and I almost I, I hesitate to ask this question because I know you're in a distinct minority on this campus and in this room. But atheism isn't new. And even though we stand before a history of Christian tradition where we do sometimes you know, find ourselves deeply conflicted, uh, humbled, and chastened, atheism now has uh, two centuries of performance as well. And its history has been at least as bad as ours. So I'm just curious as to what it provides, sort of morally, that, that you find seemingly uh, absent in the Christian and Jewish tradition that would make me think that, that making that move would somehow allow me to at least proceed uh, in, um, uh, morally. Well, that's a good, it is a good question. Um, in the first place, I, I would certainly want to distinguish between, uh, you know, what sort of moral theory and, and what sort of moral precepts uh, one is committed to and one's actual behavior. That's a familiar distinction to Christians, uh, certainly. Um, uh, I, I shouldn't have thought that atheism, as, as atheism, is, uh, has any commitments one way or the other with respect to uh, either of those matters. Um, it's not as if atheism is a uh, unified body of thought. I mean, literally, it's simply a denial of theism. Um, if the question be put to me whether uh, one can provide a, a more plausible or more coherent moral theory from um, uh, you know, that, that doesn't invoke a deity, uh, then one can, by invoking a deity, uh, I should say, I, I think one can. Uh, obviously, that's a contentious claim. Um, but, I mean, it's not as if atheists are somehow philosophically or theoretically bereft of uh, the resources to put forward um, moral theories. In fact, for, by my count, I... I, I guess uh, <clears throat> in uh, contemporary philosophical scene, there are more non-theistic, I shouldn't say atheistic, but non-theistic uh, moral theories than theistic ones. Uh, as to the historical record, um, I'm not sure what exactly to say about that. Uh, um, you know, I mean, it's commonly said, look at the, the terrible... Uh, the, the terrible consequences that atheism had in Nazi Germany and in Soviet Russia and, and in the, the killing fields in Cambodia and so on. Um, I don't want to try here to say much about those historical matters. I do, uh, I would remind you, at least so far as um, the, the, the Nazi era goes, uh, Hitler never renounced his Catholicism and I don't think it can be denied that the uh, success uh, of the pogrom against the Jews was in large measure fueled by ancient Christian hatreds against the Jews in Europe. There's a gentleman in the back toward the middle. I don't have many in the queue right now, so if you're wanting to ask a question, uh, don't be shy. Uh, my question is for uh, Professor Fales. I want to thank you for your um, thoughtful critique. Um, in your paper yesterday morning and then in your critique of sites um, this, this afternoon, the core of your critique, as I see it, is that you are claiming a higher moral ground than sites in that his is a voluntarism which assumes the truth of Scripture over against what must be his moral inclinations against seeing the Bible as true. Whereas you 
are claiming to take as your priority your own moral intuitions over against what the Bible says to be true. And I guess I just want to point out that that decision itself is a claim, um, that decision to take your own moral intuition over the Bible is itself a voluntarism that is, has not to this point been proven or substantiated. And I'd like to ask how you defend yourself against this critique, which basically makes your own moral position not a high ground, but actually a preference. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I do that. I, I hope in, in all humil humility, I um, by no means think that my moral intuitions are uh, infallible. Um, I, uh, I, I do uh, defend um, that sort of a methodological stance, as you may recall, by appeal to the uh, the argument that Locke makes. Um, ultimately, I think Locke is right. We have to appeal to uh, our best moral judgments. Um, uh, talk of intuition here is, is surely rather too simple. It's not just a matter of intuitions. It's obviously also a matter of uh, uh, considerable reflection, um, uh, considerable uh, effort to... Um, speak with other people who might have wisdom in such matters. Um, <clears throat> but I do, I do reject the suggestion which I find in a, a strand of in a good deal of Christian apologetics, which says that, um, uh, you know, uh, roughly it goes like this, who are we to set up our moral judgments uh, as higher than God's? Uh, what we must do rather is to admit our um, our moral weakness, perhaps even depravity as human beings, and submit to the higher judgment of God. That does seem to me to get the, uh, the cart before the horse. Wes Morrison. Yeah, I'd like to just chime in on that very briefly. It seems to me that the problem that's been highlighted at this conference arises not from moral intuitions that are had by atheists and trying to square biblical passages with those. It arises from an apparent conflict between certain biblical passages and moral beliefs, principles that are held by everyone in this room, whatever they believe about God. So even if there were no atheists in the world, it seems to me that Christians could and should still be asking themselves, these very hard questions. How can we believe that God is loving, merciful, kind, compassionate, forgiving, and so on, and at the same time, believe that God ordered the extermination of various peoples? Uh, and how, I just, wanna, I just wanna leave it at that. It's, it's an observation. Um, it isn't a matter of fails having, putting his moral intuition uh, against God. It's a matter of all of us, whatever our, whatever our beliefs are, whether we're Christians or not, whether we're Jews, whatever. It's a matter for all of us to consider, well, how do these passages square with what we all believe about genocide? If I can comment, I agree wholeheartedly. And, and, uh, so do I. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean I, 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 to my mind, the atheist uh, issue is neither here nor there. It seems to me to be more of a matter of how Christians think about the relationship of the parts of their Bibles to their holes. So this morning when you said, you know, well, Psalm 137, you know, we just can't go with that. And then we, and then we batted around. Somebody says, well, this is, you didn't hear the genre and all that. I think it's very productive to study the tradition to see how they wrestle with these serious problems. An Augustine resorts to allegory, but that's by no means the only reading of that. I mean, many, many church fathers just simply refuse to divide the person of Jesus Christ, the Logos, from the, from, from the divine identity of God in the Old Testament. They just don't do it. Now, should they do it? But I think those are the kind of questions we're probably batting around in here, is how the parts of the Bible can be, can be construed together. And um, I don't know that atheism is really... Uh, I mean, you're looking in on a struggle, and I, I'm a bit puzzled myself as to what the conference is supposed to accomplish. It sounds to me like philosophers are, are wanting to read the Bible and, and, and have invited some people in, and 
and somebody said that the, he got invited here so that he could get moved around and it was sort of fodder for some sort of thing going, I haven't a clue. Uh, but I tend to agree with you that the atheist thing, I mean, it, it just, it's just sitting there as a, as a subsidiary of other questions or even above them as, a, as other questions are being posed by theists, Jews, Christians, and others about how they read their Bibles um, and how they make sense of them. And I've, I've benefited enormously from some, some valiant efforts. Uh, I w I'd like to have a conference where um, it, w we, it wasn't presumed that we were talking about were texts that all assume were, were really difficult or something. I mean, we're more with Gary on this. Uh, harem's a mystery to me. I don't know very much about it. Who owns any land? What's natural rights to land? I mean, I wanted to ask Nick that earlier. I mean, in Genesis, it doesn't seem like anybody has any natural rights to any land. God sort of gives them, he sets it up in such a way everybody gets a piece, and then they build a tower and all crashes down. And from then, it's all bets off. <laughs> Make some promises. I mean, it's not clear whose land this is. You know, so, but I mean, I've enjoyed those kind of questions, but I agree wholeheartedly. I don't think it has a whole lot to do with, with atheism. And indeed, I think the atheists ask far more profound questions of the broken heart Although I don't hear that surface a lot, I don't think this is really about morality, finally. I think it's about all kinds of other things. 